Wild Wild podcast. I'm your host, Miles Irving, and I'll shortly be introducing and welcoming this week's guest, who is Philip B. Stark of the Open Source Food Project at uh, the University of Berkeley in California. Uh, prior to that, I just want to give an update in terms of where we are in time and space in relation to the cycles and the seasons and uh, the, the growth of plants that are edible and, and good to eat. We are at a point now where everything is really coming to that point of fulfillment, that ultimate sort of fatness at the end of the growth cycle of plants, which is there to produce seed that can keep the life cycles going for another year. Um, and in many cases put seed in the ground which could survive for um, as, as long as a century until the right conditions prevail um, for it to sp spring up from the ground. So sometimes uh, plants like fat hen and um, plants like many of the mustards, they have such an amazing um, strategy to just keep that genetic material safe and sound within the, um, the sealed unit of a seed. Uh, and, and, and it can it can mean that there are no ideal conditions for a very long period of time, but that seed in the ground can just spring up when the when the conditions are right again. And we found that particularly with with fat hen, which um, for those of you who don't know, that's a canopodium or goosefoot species, which is very closely related to the superfood grain or seed quinoa. And we found that if you try and get that to germinate, it's it's actually quite difficult to do it. That you have to get involved with sort of putting it in the freezer and, and, and things like that. Uh, and, and you don't always succeed because the conditions are so precise. And yet it does germinate all over the place every year and produces in, a, in upwards of 50,000 seeds per plant. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing strategy. Um, and the peculiar conditions that it requires are a reflection of, for me, the notion of wildness, that this is, this is elusive. It doesn't uh, lend itself particularly well to, to domestication and, and being under our control. And the, and the mustard seeds are kept preserved by um, mustard oils, which um, for us, they, they behave as flavor chemicals, but that's part of what keeps the, uh, the, the, the seed viable for, for that plant. Those are two of the seeds which are, um, are either ripe or fully ripe at the moment. We have black mustard seeds around, which, which are, are fully ripe and you can just harvest um, a great big branch of that and, and shake it into a bag and you have mustard seeds for the year. Um, quinoa is, uh, sorry, fat hen is, 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 is just now ripening up in, in various places and there are cherry plums dropping on the paths in many areas near us. Not strictly a wild plant, but it, it kind of feels wild because um, it's not planted so that a, a farmer can come through and harvest and, and they're just dropped onto the path where you can just pick them up and gather them and eat them. It, 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 it feels like um, a feast has been laid on when you see these beautiful, delicious, sweet and juicy fruits um, just, just there for the taking. Blackberries are beginning to ripen up or, or brambles, rubus species in the rose family. Such an abundant plant and the sort of thing that, that is still for many people um, just a commonplace, an ordinary thing to gather a blackberry from the hedgerow. And, and I love that. I often say to people who think that they don't know anything about foraging, I say, do you, do you ever pick blackberries? And, and it proves that they're still in that relationship with, with wildness in their surroundings because they, they certainly do. Not everybody, but an, a, a very high percentage of the population in the UK, I'd say, experience that every year. And it means that they, they are at least one foot into this concept that wild landscapes provide food that you can eat without thinking twice about it. And then uh, plantain seeds. You really are hard pressed to walk more than 100 meters in any direction at the moment um, where we are without finding some greater plantain seeds on there and they're long sort of thin spikes with lots of seeds uh, packed in together uh, along that stem. And you can just snap the, the uh, stem off at the base and pull them off with your hand between your thumb and forefinger and just have a delicious mouthful of nutty seeds which are rich in protein and also they are basically the same thing as the psyllium husk that is sold in many um, health food stores which is um, a, a, an aid to gut health and most people don't realize that in, in many parts of the globe there is another uh, one or other plantago species which is what produces the psyllium husk and that's what um, the greater plantain is there's one or other of those plantago species freely available and you can if you take the time to just cut them in the in uh, this this time of year and through into the autumn you can have quite a um, supply 
and and uh, store of those to last you through the year and the same is true of nettles nettle seeds are really fattening up now i'm harvesting them green and trying to uh remember just to just to eat a few of those at least once a day and um feed them to my family as well they um they'll soon be sort of drying and turning brown some people prefer, prefer to harvest them when they're when they're brown but anyway the point with those is also you can you can get a year's supply and nettles are just everywhere now you just put a glove on and, and pull up the stem and and you can get a um a good handful from each plant you could put that somewhere to dry and rub it through a a uh a sort of garden colander and then just store them for the year they have kind of tonic properties some people say uh, adaptogen properties i'm not sure if that's strictly accurate but they certainly they are a boost for the whole system and they contain neurotransmitters such as serotonin which can help uh you know with the cheerfulness that's associated with that compound um and and just the amazing thing that there are plants like plantain and and nettle which are uh so associated with human habitation they they seem to love to grow nearby where people are plantain will grow on rough grassy areas that, that get stomped on or driven even driven on all the time nettles in any area rich in nitrogen near human human dwellings they just seem to be almost rocking up at our door uh, with a will to feed and, and nourish us uh, um, and um it just seems like that and um I think it's like it behoves us to to just open the door and welcome them in because these are such beneficial plants and just that sense of uh, engaging with the with the nourishing tendency tendencies of our um, e ecosystems that we find ourselves in and specifically an ecosystem that has developed in response to us um, to be there where where um, people have shaped an environment and they find that the niche that they prefer is is that human shaped environment. Um, that's a thought we could take further and further and, um, and I'm sure we will. So now I'll get on to introduce Philip. So Philip runs a thing called the Wild and Feral um, Week every year and he tries to encourage people to uh, engage with wild plants through the, through the medium of, of bars and restaurants and that's kind of drawing in farms where they have wild plants growing and, and he's trying to encourage people to make use of those plants whether it's the farmer gathering them or the um, bar and cocktail guy working it into his drinks menu or the chef putting it on his menu lots of different things and every year there's more and more participants in this so you, you might want to check that out for for next year you could perhaps get involved wherever you are in the world that's the beauty of this project it's a global project and so philip's a, a man after my own heart really because you know the purpose of the the the, the world wild podcast is to try and get this perspective that, that we're all the same wherever we are um even though like something i just mentioned now with the, with the seasons of course if you live in malaysia you wouldn't have the same sense of the cycles of the seasons uh the the, the kind of world view that that um is reflected in engaging with with the natural environment there would be very different from in a temperate zone where, where i am where there's a very clearly delineated winter and summer and so on um so I mean that's a topic I'll probably get into in more depth another time. Like the, the how the, the the sort of metaphors that form the basis of our life are a reflection of our particular ecology and our particular um, climate where we are, and therefore it means that we have a different experience, and and therefore that sort of um, system of metaphors and ideas in different parts of the world where the climate and the ecology varies. Um, so it's not all the same, in other words. So um, the world wild projects is something that extends beyond beyond this podcast and i hope to be able to tell people more about that but really the podcast lays a foundation for it in that people like philip can come on and tell tell us what what he's doing um where he is and you'll you'll hear some of the um, amazing projects he's doing just analyzing plants uh, that grow out of what's thought to be um toxic soil and and seeing whether they're safe to eat or not and analyzing the nutrition and and also the fact that Philip is driving to actually affect public policy so that it becomes a common place to make use of these things. So people working all around the world in different aspects of this, of reconnecting people with the, with the wild heritage, um, is something that, that uh, we're hoping to create some kind of linkage with, but just by getting these voices um, to, to, to broadcast out through from, from one space, the World Wild Podcast, which is not to say it's the only space that, that, that is, is gathering people together, but that's a... Uh, that's the contribution that we're trying to make. 
Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to, to have Philip with us and uh, I have a feeling that this conversation is actually going to be the start of some um, practical engagement um, between us that, that uh, I'm sure you're going to hear more about in the future. So I'd like to welcome Philip B. Stark from Berkeley University to the Worldwide Podcast. Hello, Philip. Hi, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's great to have you here. Now, of course, we met a few years back at the um, the Madfield event in Copenhagen, uh, which actually was quite a gathering of wild food characters from, from around the world, wasn't it? I, I was quite starstruck uh, meet, meeting you and many others. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it makes you wonder why we uh, wild fooders don't, you know, don't have our own thing where we all gather <laughs> once a year. It kind of feels like we should do. That's what the AOF is up to, yes? We, we did talk about it in, in, in Copenhagen, didn't we? So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have to make that happen. That would be lovely. So, tell me about what you're working on just now, Philip. I, um, I've said a few things about your work in, in the introduction, but we'd love to have a, a, you know, an update of what's, um, what's happening at Berkeley now. There's four or five different threads to our work. One of them is testing wild foods that are growing in urban environments to understand whether they're safe to eat despite the environmental challenges that they have from, say, lead in the soil or uh, pollution from cars or this or that, and also testing them for nutritional uh, value. Um, we have an annual event that we try to organize called Wild and Feral Food Week, which tries to get weeds on plates around the world, um, uh, so on, on off farms and from foragers uh, into uh, restaurants and cafes and diners and bars and whatever, and onto plates and into glasses. Um, and the goal of that is a number of things. One, to try to create a supply chain so that these delicious, nutritious foods that volunteer between the rows of farms and at the margins of farms and even in, through cracks in the sidewalk don't go to waste, um, but actually can end up um, getting eaten by people, um, partly to raise awareness so that people are uh, chefs and bartenders and eaters and drinkers become aware of uh, how delicious and interesting these ingredients are and what their potential is. Um, and, uh, you know, partly to kind of re-normalize re these foods that have been part of ancestral diets for tens of thousands of years, but have fallen out of fashion as agriculture has moved more towards grow cropping and automation and uh, away from a more biodiverse uh, um, kind of farming and gathering uh, approach to, to feeding ourselves. Another thread to our work is public policy. Um, unlike uh, the UK, there is no right to forage on public lands or on anyone's private land but your own. Um, and especially in cities and uh, townships where herbicides have already been reduced or eliminated, it would be nice to be able to incorporate um, foraging of non-native invasive species, species invasivity as part of pest control. Um, and as a way to contribute to the sustainability of the food system, food equity, and food access. I think those are, those are probably the, the, the main threads, but looking at um, agricultural methods, including cover crops and uh, the idea of economic cover crops, could farmers be improving the quality of their soil um, by deliberately allowing weeds to grow, increasing the biodiversity both above and below the ground, um, improving the, uh, you know, re reducing erosion, reducing uh, water use, the need for irrigation, um, and increasing the resilience of their farms to pets, to drought, to all of these other things um, by deliberately, um, uh, you know, em embracing the weeds as a, as a potential economic crop. Well, that's fascinating. Um, in the way, in the situation that you've just described there, you're not talking about the weeds replacing the existing crops. You're, you're talking about a sort of coexistence. So they're like a by crop, but they're they're not only tolerated, but the benefits are, are being embraced and recognised. Sort of thing. 
so there there are cultures and um, practices, in, including in agroecology, that um, recognize the benefits of you know, of some weeds as companion plants. Um, weeds can actually help suppress worse pests um, through all allelopathy. They basically some of them exude chemicals into the soil that can um, keep other kinds of things that might be a bigger nuisance from competing with the deliberate uh, deliberately planted crops. Um, they can also be a distractor for uh, insects and other pests so that they don't attack the economic crops. Um, but uh, you actually raise an important issue, which is what will the crops of the future look like in the face of changing climate uh, on the planet? And I, I think that our Western society is going to be faced with uh, a big choice between trying to engineer our way into crops that will do well with uh, more weather extremes, either through uh, GMOs or CRISPR or some similar technology. Or um, if we think about what we would actually like the crops of the future to, to do, what we would like them to be like. You would like um, plants that compete very well, um, that don't require a lot of inputs, water, fertilizer, so forth and so on. You'd like them to propagate easily. Uh, if they're perennials, you'd like them to propagate vegetatively, even from fragments of roots. If they're annuals, you'd like them to produce a lot of seed. You'd like them to be able to start producing food early in the season and continue late in the season. Um, uh, you'd like them to be sexually promiscuous in that uh, they can be pollinated by wind or by insects or by um, birds. You want them to sort of be nonspecific in their requirements for, for pollination. Uh, and all of these things are, are basically properties of weeds. Uh, so um, if we have edible weeds, um, they could play an incredibly important role uh, on a changing planet in providing food security, uh, stability, you know, and access at, at you know, potentially lower environmental cost than some of the engineered solutions. I would say that you know our, our options are you know try to engineer this ourselves, or look to the wisdom of nature uh, to provide a solution already. Um, uh, people call that biomimicry uh, and other things. Um, in fact, it, it really I think is just science. I mean, the, nature has the opportunity to do. Um, uncountably many experiments um, over uh, unfathomable periods of time, and we are a relatively new species, um, relatively new at trying to engineer foods, and looking at what nature has done uh, to produce these things, I think is, is likely to be a more successful strategy um, with lower environmental impact. Well, I, I think a little while ago, I had, to, I had to give a talk to some engineers, and so I was sort of scratching around on the etymology of the word uh, engineer. And it turns out there's a Latin word, um, ingenium, and it, it has this sense of the genius of a landscape. And it's it's kind of funny that what we what we end up with when we think of engineering is 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 sort of mechanisms that um, are expressed through our technology and so on, which on the whole is going contrary to the natural systems. But what this talk I had to give made me start thinking was, well, maybe we need to rethink engineering. You know, maybe maybe if our idea of processes that we can uh, kind of design was more along the lines that you mentioned there, what people are now calling biomimicry. If we were going down into, into um, natural systems and looking at the inherent, very complex order there, it is as if a genius has designed it, and 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 of course, if someone could sit there for for um, several billion years working on their designs, they'd come up with something pretty good, wouldn't they? Whereas here we are um, with just a few hundred thousand years that we've been here, and in just a few hundred years that we've been working with the the technological insight, the scientific insights that we have currently. Of course, we're going to be just like um, 
foolish kids making all sorts of terrible mistakes. But the trouble is our mistakes are amplified so powerfully, aren't they, in, in terms of how they affect the biosphere. Maybe it'd be, maybe it'd be good if, as you say, we, we stop engineering from, from our heads and, and, and start engineering from what we can learn from, from the biosphere. Well, if, uh, if wisdom is being able to learn from the mistakes of others, um, then uh, <laughs> we have an opportunity to learn from uh, the fact that nature has uh, done uncountably many failed experiments and what we're seeing are the remaining, you know, successes, largely the successes. I just think it's almost like someone should tell a mythological story or perhaps there is one out there, you know, about a journey that you go on and there's this person with you that you perceive as being a threat and a nuisance and, and you just really wish they'd go away. And it turns out at the end of the journey that they've been trying to help you all along and you, you eventually embrace them as is the best friend that you ever had. I think that would be the story of weeds, wouldn't it? Because we've been trying to get rid of them for ever since the, the dawn of agriculture. And yet they've well, been trying to help us and they're still they're still here trying to feed us and even more than that, I mean we we created them through agriculture. Um the I've heard these systems referred to as um transported ecologies or transported landscapes that the weeds by and large um, have all these wonderful adaptations that actually require bare soil or disturbed soil in order to thrive, in order to take advantage of those adaptations um, typically. I mean, m many of the foods that we cultivate, um, you know, were selectively bred from wild variants. The vast majority, if not all of them, you know, were, were selected for in that particular way. But at the same time, agriculture itself uh, selects for other things that opportunistically pop up where you've cleared the ground, where things are exposed uh, directly to light, um, where something that uh, initially doesn't have a lot of competition, if it can, say, form a basal rosette that is going to block the light uh, to keep other things from germinating, um, or that it is going to, um, you know, ha have some kind of growth pattern that makes it difficult for other things to compete, or uh, exude um, chemicals into the soil that will, will prevent other plants from germinating, so forth and so on. But to get that advantage, it kind of needs the head start of bare soil. And a lot of the, the plants that we refer to as weeds now, um, you know, are in fact edible, do thrive in environments like that where we are deliberately trying to cultivate something else. Um, and, uh, you know, we've selected for them. Those that survive are those that resist the hoe. Um, you try to uh, er eradicate dandelion with the hoe, and instead of one dandelion, you have six dandelions. Um, so, uh, you know, all of these things have kind of created selective pressure in the direction of, 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 uh, of weeds, which, you know, you and I, I think, are completely aligned. That other other people see weeds, we see food waste um, or wasted culinary opportunity. Um, <laughs> so um, we we need to somehow hack uh, the public perception of these plants. They're unjustly marginalized, and in fact, they're delicious, nutritious, um, in many cases, medicinal um, and incredibly abundant. And in the case of dandelion, that, that would be one of the ones you were alluding to earlier when you said about improving soil quality presumably, because it, it's it's going deep down in order to bring up minerals that cultivated plants would just leave down there in the subsoil. It wouldn't be able to reach them. Right? So, um, I mean, dandelion is an interesting case because it was deliberately cultivated as food and medicine, and in fact, uh, deliberately introduced to North America by European um, settlers. But, um, you know, many of these plants uh, do play nice uh, with mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, some of them are legumes and will help fix nitrogen, things like vetch um, mm. and uh, wild peas. Uh, that, you know, they, they have various um, salutary you know, effects on soil through the microbiome um, and, uh, and also through pulling, pulling other chemicals up. Uh, simply mechanical uh, things, providing shade, um, providing cover to reduce erosion, providing some structure to the soil through the root system to, to reduce erosion as well. 
um, and um, you know getting carbon down into the soil to feed uh, to feed the, the critters that are there. So it's all, all of these things. Mm. What's what's the could, could you tell us a bit more about the, the project where you've been um, doing a lot of analysis on on the um, the urban wild plants in your um, in your area? Sure. So um, you know, as you know, once once you start foraging in wild areas, your brain gets accustomed to noticing the plants. I mean, we are bred to be hunter-gatherers, and you start to see these things in urban environments as well. And uh, the question at some point, you know, the obvious question is, well, is it safe to eat these things when they're growing in, uh, you know, what we would normally think of as a, as a landscape rather than an ecosystem? Um, when they're growing in, in the built environment. Uh, so uh, together with uh, some colleagues uh, here at, at UC Berkeley, Tom Carlson, Kristen Rasmussen, um, and then more recently, uh, uh, Daphne Miller joined, joined the group. Um, we started mapping the availability of these plants. Like wh where we, we, we picked three study areas. Each were roughly three blocks by three blocks in the San Francisco Bay Area and the East Bay, which is uh, generally where Berkeley is. Oakland is a larger, more industrial city just to the south of Berkeley, and Richmond is a more industrial city to the north of Berkeley. And we had a, a, a plot in Richmond, a plot in Berkeley, and a plot in Oakland. We measured the soils for um, toxic metals, heavy metals, lead, cadmium, uh, silver, copper, other, other things. Um, and then we measured the plant tissue uh, in a number of places for those metals. And then in a smaller number of places, we did tests on wet tissue for not just metals, but also for uh, PCBs and herbicides and specifically for glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And the question was in, in urban places that have a lot of exposure to industrial chemicals and contamination, either because of how the land was used before, like a, an abandoned shipyard, uh, or because of proximity to major roadways, um, are the plants still safe to eat? Do the plants uh, phytoaccumulate or concentrate these things from their environment, or do they kind of ignore them um, and only take what they need? And uh, what we found uh, for the species we tested was that even where the soil had elevated levels of lead and cadmium, the plants were not accumulating them. Uh, no, simply rinsing the dirt off the plants, because the dirt itself isn't safe, but because of the, the lead content, uh, was enough to make the plants safe to eat. The only thing we found that was uh, accumulating at all worrisome levels of, of anything was a wild lettuce that was, uh, if I recall correctly, accumulating cadmium, but you'd still need to eat, uh, a, you know, a couple of kilograms of the day. And as you know, wild lettuces are punishingly bitter. Um, it would be hard to choke down a mouthful of it, much less a kilogram of it. So um, everything that we tested turned out to be safe. The caveat, of course, is those are that was only about uh, seven or eight species. Things depend on soil chemistry. They depend on you know all kinds of variables, and I, I wouldn't want to generalize yet. Um, but at the moment, things are looking very promising. Could you let us know what the what the species were? I'm fascinated to know. Um, let me uh, look it up. One sec. I don't remember offhand. Well, well, I mean, while you're looking it up, so we we did some testing near us, and we did find quite high levels of lead. But I don't know whether that was um, a reflection of the particular plant species. So, what species did you test? One of them was Beta vulgaris. So that's the, being in the goosefoot family. The goosefoot family does seem to be particularly uh, prone to taking up heavy metals. So it'd be the same for fat hen. Um, I would expect if there'd have been fat. That's hen. Interesting, as I know that there's some Indian brassicas that are used for phytoremediation of lead in particular. Yeah. But uh, my understanding was in order to get them to take up lead effectively, you need to chelate the lead to make it more bioavailable and typically need to deprive uh, the plants of something else they need, like phosphorus. Um, oh, yeah, I'm also aware that the, the brassicas are also more likely to have lead if anything is, is going to. So the, the three that I'd be thinking of would be nettles, brassicas and, and uh, goosefoot plants. 
But we also tested um, we also tested chick chickweed, and and that came up quite high in lead. So, so I think we tested chickweed, and let me I'm looking for our uh, paper here. It's on plus one. Um, and the title is Open Source Food, Nutrition, Toxicology, and Availability of Wild Edible Greens in the East Bay. We'll put this um, in the podcast notes so people can access it. Great. Um, thank you. So, be so to know if, so if there were some different conditions that, that, that meant, as you say, that, that hadn't occurred to me, like the bioavailability side to it. or Yeah, I, I just assumed that anywhere with, with um, next to a fairly busy road as this was, that the plants would automatically take it up. So this this is absolutely fascinating. So w there are tests on dry plant tissue. Uh, we tested uh, mallow, malva silvestris, uh, bristly ox tongue, um, cat's ear, English plantain, wild lettuce, nasturtium, dandelion, and sweet fennel. And then our tests on wet tissue, uh, we had chickweed, Dandelion, dock, mallow, nasturtium, and oxalis. And the chickweed was not accumulating uh, lead. I'll, I'll have to dig out our test results. We, we sent it away to a lab. We don't have facilities here. It was several years ago, but the, yeah, I'll have to send them across to you so you can um, compare them. That's interesting. But no, no fat hen then, because no, we didn't have uh, not a lot of lambs quarters uh, uh, in that area. I'm not sure I've even found it in any of those three study areas. Just knowing what I do about the family, I would still be concerned that it might have um, taken up uh, the heavy metals even in that even in that area. It might it might be worth trying to clarify that point. But that, but anyway, yeah. the plants are amazing. That's that's incredible. All those plants, you would quite reasonably assume that they would be taking up all of that stuff, and and yet you've they've got a clean bill of health. That's amazing. The roots presumably would have a higher load than the greens, um, and I think it's folk wisdom at least that the fruits are the least likely to be contaminated. The other studies I'm aware of, uh, one was done on behalf of the Boston Canning Society. I, I might have their name slightly wrong. It was a professor from uh, Wellesley, his name escapes me at the moment. So one of the members of the Canning Society showed up with elevated levels of, of lead in his or her blood, and there was concern that it was coming from foraging fruits and other things in, in the city of Boston. And so they, they did measurements on the, the fruits and some leafy greens and found the results were comparable to ours. There was nothing of concern. There's groups that have studied this in uh, Italy and in Germany, and if I recall correctly, the study in Italy found higher levels of metals and things that were further from roadways than rather than closer to roadways. Again, suggesting that you know local geology matters as much as industrial exposure. But at at the moment, you know, again, I I would not generalize to other places or other species. But it, it does seem pretty promising. The other, the other shoe, uh, the, on the other side of this is the nutritional content, um, which is incredibly high. Um, as you know, as we bred plants selectively for agriculture, the properties that we've tended to select for are not related to nutrition. They're related to um, shelf life and transportability and yield, but yield measured in pounds, not measured in, in nutritional value. Uh, and we haven't even, I mean, we, to the extent that we've bred for flavor, very often it's been for mildness rather than for interestingness. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, it turns out that as we've made the flavors milder, we've selectively bred out a lot of the um, phytonutrients, phytochemicals that uh, have a, that are incredibly important for nutrition, but that have strong flavors. Well, um, as you're saying, Ed, I mean, I, I think you could you could say breeding for not flavor rather than breeding yeah. for flavor for and blandness, and, yeah, yeah, or sweetness. Uh, observation um, someone made a few years ago when we were thinking about the cultivation of wild celery is that mm -hmm. someone basically solved the problem of of how to market water because. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because cultivated celery is just wild celery 
only 10 times the size because you've, you've got it to take up lots of water and uh, make it, again, much milder and blander. So um, compared to cultivated crops that we think of as being especially nutritious, like kale or spinach, um, most of these plants look look even better, uh, the things that we that we did the tests on, like chickweed, dandelion, dock, mallow, etc. Mallow turns out to be especially high in calcium. There's uh, as much mallow in a uh, as much calcium in a cup of mallow as there is in a cup of milk. Mm. Um, so uh, for the vegans in the audience, um, if you're looking for a source of calcium, there, there you go. Well, I believe mallow is also an amazing source of protein. So the vegans should be making a beeline for that one. Um, yeah, it's uh, got roughly, let's see, one and a third times uh, the protein of kale uh, kind of double or triple the protein of uh, chickweed or dandelion. Uh, it's uh, very quite high. I agree. Yeah, about it's about four percent by weight. Four percent protein by weight. Yeah. So given given that there's so much nutrition in these plants, it's it's a very good thing that you've managed to set people's mind at ease that it is safe to eat them from these places. I and mean, that's an extraordinary accomplishment. Well, I, I, again, I I don't want to overclaim here um we, we've shown that there there are situations where it's safe but i i uh i would love to do a lot more testing to see how far that generalizes and in the places where where you've where you've got that where you are able to make that claim have you been finding that you're able to tell the people that matter as it as it were like local people is it, are, are you able to somehow get the information across to them yeah it's a really interesting question and, and set of problems. Um, some people who were, you know, happened upon us while we were out in the field were very interested and wanted to know what the results were uh, for the soil testing and were interested in the plants. And, and other people, uh, the response was, um, that's really gross. Uh, why would I pick anything off the ground and eat it? Um, the the way I characterize some of this, so I mean, there, there are definitely cultures that forage more than others, and a lot of um, in the U.S. people you you see foraging very often are, are are people who are first or second generation immigrants from places where there is an active practice of foraging for you know some 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 fraction of what ends up on the dining room table. Um, and then there's, you know, kind of a hipster high-end cuisine movement that, that is using, you know, foraging uh, for unusual ingredients or connection to nature or so forth. But there's, a, there's an enormous uh, middle where people are so disconnected from the source of their food that they don't recognize food as food unless it comes in a plastic bag or is put on a plate in front of them. Mm. I describe this as we've, we've abdicated our kind of power over our own food to a food clergy that tells us, you know, what's okay to eat and what isn't. And I'm kind of uh, pushing for a, a food Protestantism of a kind where everyone is empowered to tell what is and isn't food. But this was really driven home to me. Uh, I was at a farmer's market in Oakland and dandelion was for sale in the market for $1.75 a bunch. And, you know, I turned my head 90 degrees to the left and there's a yard full of dandelion that nobody is picking because it isn't food. It isn't in a plastic bag. Um, and it, it really is odd, but, you know, both that we don't recognize these things and um, also that we don't tend to think about the history of the foods that show up on our plate or in a grocery store, but we imagine the history of things that we see in the ground. So one of the first questions that I get when I take people you know, out on a food identification walk or foraging walk is like, what about dog pee? Right. And they can, they can imagine a dog, you know, raising its leg and, and, uh, and, and peeing on the dandelion, but they don't think about that, head of organic lettuce that they bought at the grocery store and the fact that, you know, it was probably grown in manure uh, or, you know, something like it yeah. um, and, uh, you know, picked by one set of hands and transported in a truck on the highway and picked over by other sets of hands and many consumers before, you know, this particular person decided to take it home. And there's a lovely 
paragraph to that effect in um, Stalking the Wild Asparagus, uh, Yul Gibbons' uh, book um, about, you know, people will object to foraging on the grounds of hygiene, and he, he walks you through what the history of a head of lettuce would be. So mm. for some reason, you know, when it shows up on the grocery store shelf or on a plate, it's been, um, you know, sanctified and we, we just don't think of what its history was. It, it was. it was, you know, born fresh and pure when it appeared on our plate, whereas something actually in its natural habitat growing in soil, we have this response to it that that's gross, it's in the dirt. Um, and uh, it, it really is odd. I mean, I don't know. In terms, of, in terms of trying to get this information across to people, you know, it, it's, 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 I'm tickled by your analogy there to, to a you know, food priesthood with the, with the um, industrial food lobby and nutritionists and so on all queuing up to tell us what we can eat. And usually because they have a professional interest in that, because they're, they're paid to sell it to us or explain it to us. But uh, I think there's a, there's a slight problem with your analogy of Protestantism, though, um, which is that <laughs> I, I am a bit of a lay student of the Reformation. And, and, and uh, what happened there is a bit like in the, um, you know, that song by The Who, uh, Won't Get Fooled Again, you know, Meet the New <laughs> Boss, same as the old boss, you know. Yeah, there's still, yeah. still, there still is that thing of you know you 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 uh, you have some bloke up the front that you need to come and listen to every week within Protestantism. That was from the outset quite a strong uh, thread, but there were these um, these real the the true Protestants, in my opinion, were this this crowd uh, called the Anabaptists who had no hierarchy, no leaders, and and all of their gatherings had everybody contributing. It was sort of multi voice sort of situation. Anyway, I'm going somewhere with this. So I've done to think that, that in the wild food world, we have basically uh, had that Protestant Reformation thing, you know, and that people like me and, and you know, lots of people who take people out on wild food walks, we have ended up being that, that preacher at the front that tells everybody everything and they think that they need, you know, an expert to tell them. And, I, and I think I've seen where the problem is. So I'm, I've yet to do anything about it, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. I think the problem is that we draw people in from all over the place who come on our walks in a place where they don't live. And then they go back to where they do live, and the really keen ones among them, they'll remember a few plants and crack on. But it's this kind of professional thing. People come and they pay and, and whatever. So the solution, what is the solution? What I've been thinking about is I've, I've just got to start offering to teach the people in my neighborhood to forage. And then people will be going out to somewhere where they go every day and they'll be put directly in, in, in contact so they won't, they won't need me. And uh, only, I'll still be there because the kind of thing that I'm suggesting here really is that, is that, is that wild food teachers should behave like village elders, you know, yep. so that they're there on an ongoing basis. But before long... You know, everybody knows that, and they're passing the knowledge on. The, the word "elder" uh, occurred to me several times while you were speaking. That that I mean that that's kind of what how I think we should be functioning. It, it's we we have this. There is this ancestral knowledge. We didn't create it. We inherited it. Um, none of us is discovering new edible plants that nobody knew about. We're just identifying things that people have known about for for generations and generations. And, you know, even to the point that, you know, my, my knowledge of this stuff is probably comparable to that of a four-year-old from a few hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I'm by no means an expert. Um, and it would be wonderful to get back to a situation where every child learns to identify, you know, several dozen, a hundred, you know, edible plants in, in their immediate environment where, where they live. So I, I do think that, Helping people get started down this road is incredibly important and and, and doesn't have to be difficult. Uh, you know, almost everybody can identify, you know, one or two edible plants already, whether it's just, you know, dandelion and, and oxalis or, or something like that. So they've got the beginning of a green list. Yeah. And they know that whenever they see that, if it's growing someplace that isn't too sketchy, they can, you know, rinse it off and, and you know, have it with dinner. They can, they can 
you know, throw it on their burrito in a bag or, you know, put it on a salad or, or, or whatever it is. And, and they've just augmented their nutrition with, you know, more fiber, more phytonutrients, um, more antioxidants, all of these other things, and incorporated a little bit of terroir and had something that's as fresh as it can possibly be and as seasonal as it po could possibly be because it's growing on their doorstep. Yeah. Um, and then it's just a question of adding to the list. And, you know, that doesn't have to be terribly terribly difficult. Um, and if, you know, if you're willing to take them on a walk where they live, um, you know, then every few months, uh, what's new this season? Well, here's three more things. And then next year you'll, you'll, you'll be able to recognize them on your own. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to th think through how do we take this out of just being the, the class of people who are, I mean, you, you reeled off some, earlier, you know, like hipsters or foodies or, you know, who would be interested. How do we take it out of just that, that kind of minority take up to just make it normal again? And the only way I can think of doing it is to, is to try and get it happening as, as a kind of local community exercise. It's a bit easier where I am because I'm in a village, not a town. So there's, there's a lot more green space to choose from. Surprisingly easy here, even though I'm living in an urban area, it's just, uh, it, there's lots of stuff growing pretty much all year. When it gets to October or so, at the end of a long summer, um, there may not be as much variety. But if, if you like fennel seed, um, <laughs> I think the lift to getting the general public to forage is a very, very big lift. And I don't think it's likely to, to happen on a large scale. I think that the easiest people to... Um, awaken on some level are people who are already gardening uh just going into community gardens and and reminding people that this is what you planted deliberately but this other thing growing right next to it is also food uh just pointing out that that people are are actually growing more food than they realize and I, i've done a number of um uh, tours of community was invited to, to go to community gardens and and uh you know identify some of the wild foods that are growing there um between the rows and that, that's been very rewarding. And again, if we look at this in terms of what has the most leverage, what's likely to have the biggest impact on nutrition and food security, you know, it, it, isn't, it probably isn't getting individuals to forage, although I think there's a lot of benefit of that to the individual, including just, it's a very natural way for your brain to function, to, you know, to look at resources in the environments and kind of be, be scanning for that. And then the physical activity of bending down and the intellectual activity of, you know, figuring out what something is, all of those things are incredibly important. But what would have the, a, a bigger impact is to actually change the relationship that farmers have to these weeds and to create a supply chain. Because, um, you know, these things grow in enormous quantity or potentially enormous quantity, uh, especially on organic farms, and to uh, have farmers realize that that basically is wasted revenue, that all of those inputs are going in, uh, you know, that accidentally, they don't have to deliberately water this stuff or plant it, but if they pick it and sort the edible from the inedible, um, that's more money. Mm. That said, um, in, you know, I've, I've started to visit farms and try to understand farmers' relationships with their weeds. And even among organic farmers, it's quite variable, ranging from uh, farmers who use propane torches to burn the weeds as the weeds come up, literally a scorched earth policy, to farmers that embrace uh, the weeds as uh, as a cover crop um, that does, you know, protect and enrich the soil, um, attracts pollinators, ha has all kinds of, of, of benefits, um, including uh, the fact that many of the species are, are edible at the end of the day. So I'm um, trying to understand what the disincentives are to picking it. And some of the farms that I've approached or farmers that I've approached have said that they need to charge, you know, $20 a pound for chickweed. Um, which isn't going to sell a lot of chickweed. Um, but, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to say, instead of selling a single species, here's a wild salad mix, here's a wild braising mix, um, and, uh, you know, make it, make it more economical. I think the people who go to farmer's markets are probably very open to someone at the stall saying, hey, try this, try this wild salad mix, um, whereas 
saying, uh, go pick this thing out of the dirt on the street corner and eat it is a, is a harder sell. I mean, just focusing in on the chickweed example there, I'd, 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 I'd like to see what is exactly happening there on that, that guy's farm. Because chickweed can just be a few inches high, and if you went around picking it like that, it would take you ages. But if if they knew it was a crop and they left it alone to just get a bit bigger, you can you can end up cutting it. Um, it's basically very very bulky and and quick to pick once it's got more well established. So I think yep. it might be a matter of working a bit closer with those guys. And uh, yep. and I I personally think um, that that it's just it's a mindset thing for a lot of these people that that are, are suddenly being told that something that they've seen as a problem or or even just as a cover crop but now they've got to make a shift and think of it in terms of food i, th I think i think the problem is as foragers we come in there by nature we're really into the novelty and the innovation and we're talking to people who have a system which you just have to stick to thinking about things in a set way in order to just keep the system going if you if you if you kept innovating every five minutes it would well it's a it's a different mindset basically and i think that's half the trouble is to is to go into those places and 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 as you're doing try and sell a completely different approach to people um i think that possibly would would initially raise objections just to save themselves the hassle of having to rethink it so i think it's it's very complicated. I, I, I mean, I have succeeded, you know, once or twice in getting farmers to take a few boxes of their edible weeds to market and, and they sold out, right? It was no, it was no problem selling them. Yeah. But I think I, I've been surprised that, you know, many farmers don't really differentiate among weeds. A weed is a weed. They don't often, often they don't even know what species it is. What they know is their yeah. economic crops are the following seven things. Yeah. And that's what they have a market for. That's what restaurants are buying from them, or that's what uh, that, that's what's going to uh, a consolidator, or wholesaler, or whatever. And everything else is just a distraction. Um, and uh, you know, increasingly, especially farmers who are interested in regenerative farming practices um, or agroecological practices, are, are recognizing the role that these plants play in the in the farm ecosystem. Uh, in the soil, uh, uh, you know, biochemistry, et cetera. And, and that becomes, I think, a, a much easier sell once you really see that, that they're fulfilling a role in ecology. So that's the first point then, that, that, that they're, they're going to grasp that point first. And then that's, that's because it's an easier point for a farmer to, to, to grasp in terms of the, the uh, presence. You know, he's able to rethink the nature of the presence of those plants on the landscape. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, some farmers, you know, can read the weeds, use them as indicators to understand what the soil needs or what the soil has, because you know some some weeds will do better with different with different soil chemistry, um, and you know will will mark either um, you know a, a deficit of something or a superabundance of something. You know, but but again, ed edible weeds as companion plants. I mean, it, it, that has been the story since the dawn of agriculture, and the weeds have have moved with the deliberate crops um, from, from place to place. And they really do often function as companion plants, providing uh, or taking advantage of um, things in, in the soil that the other plants either, either need or, 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 uh, or produce. Yeah. So are you, are you looking ahead to developing any of these projects in, in particular directions, Philip? Well, I'm, I want to do a lot more thinking about uh, this slogan that, you know, the crops of the future are the weeds of today. Mm. Um, I, I really think that, that that can be incredibly important for our species as, uh, as the decades go by. I would love to do more testing of uh, toxicology and nutrition on these plants. That turns out to be quite an expensive proposition, and I need to raise more uh, grant funding um, for that. It, it costs a couple of thousand dollars a sample to do the full nutrition and toxicology testing. Um, and so if I wanted to roll that out to do it on a broader scale, it would be quite an expensive proposition. On the um, public policy front, um, I am trying to work to get our own university here to have uh, an edible weed garden deliberately 
um, and uh, to eliminate herbicides. And in fact, there's been movement throughout the whole University of California system. The president, um, uh, Janet Napolitano, uh, has now banned the use of glyphosate on uh, the UC campuses, except with, with a handful of exceptions. Unfortunately, one of the exceptions is agriculture. Um, but trying to, to, to have this notion of herbicide-free campuses, edible campuses where, you know, you are free and even encouraged to pick pick foods uh, from the walkways and where instead of trying to eradicate this stuff, instead we come up with uh, instructional signage that says, you know, hi, I'm, I'm dandelion. I'm, you know, in the Asteraceae family. I'm related to lettuce. I'm related to this and that. I'm, I have the following medicinal properties. I'm tastiest when my leaves are young and vibrant. I mean, th th that kind of a, of a thing. Think of the, the campus itself as an ecological learning laboratory um, rather than just a landscape. Um, similarly, trying to influence you know, policy at the municipal level to allow uh, taking non-native invasive plants from uh, schoolyards, parks, um, et cetera. I, I would love to see a municipality pass a one-time parcel tax to pay for soil testing throughout, say, the entire city. So for you know, $50 an address would be more than enough to do testing for heavy metals and other things um, at, at every address, which would then let people know where it was safe to, uh, to forage, but also to farm, to have, uh, have their own uh, food gardens and so forth. I think that could be a really interesting thing to push for. And do you have people um, in the uh, municipality that, that, that are engaging with you on these things? Do, do you have allies who kind of see what you're trying to get to? Unfortunately, not in positions of power uh, right. within within Berkeley. And I spoke to the mayor uh, briefly some years ago, and he was very encouraging, but then didn't return my email. So I, I don't know uh, uh, what's up with that exactly. But um, the local park systems, it's, uh, it's a hard sell. Kind of interestingly, one of the first things that comes up when you speak to people is like, is the issue of liability. Um, and oh, if we let people take things, what if they pick something poisonous, will we be responsible? Um, what I find ironic about that is that they're happy to allow people to ride mountain bikes and other things that are, you know, potentially lethal without signing a release or anything else. Um, somehow, again, it's this lack of, uh, it's this abdication of responsibility to the food clergy that seems to make, you know, poisoning this large looming, you know, threat uh, that, oh, we're, we don't know how to identify food instead of trusting that people actually uh, are, are really quite good at this um, once they get the slightest bit of information. I mean, we're, you're not going to mistake free say for, you know, iceberg lettuce accidentally in the grocery store um, any more than, you know, after a few days of experience, you're going to confuse, you know, poison hemlock with cow parsnip. Yeah. And, and also it, it exaggerates the threat, doesn't it? You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always keen to emphasize to people that you can't just willy-nilly eat everything because there are poisonous things out there. But actually, when you look at how much toxic stuff there is out there compared to how, how much edible, it is a tiny percentage. You wouldn't think that, given the, the, the amount of emphasis that's given to toxicology for people who are very nervous. Well, I think also people... Um, it's one thing to forage on uh, to forage greens, and another thing to forage mushrooms. Um, easier identification, fewer things are going to cause your liver to fail. Well, it's fantastic to get a window into all of these things you're doing there, and um, I'm glad that we can broadcast this to um, the wider wild food community. We've had a few people on here recently that that are uh, well. For example, Sunny Savage in Hawaii is doing um, a lot of work around invasives there and foraging as a as a, a way of addressing that i'm sure you know sunny she's, but it's she, she's she's doing amazing stuff she actually um came through berkeley a, a few months ago we went we went out foraging together it was fun yeah it's just yeah i mean i'm i'm just just thrilled to be just getting these um insights to what's happening in various different geographical locations for some reason we've had a far more people from north america than anywhere else including the uk <laughs> on this podcast, but uh, I'm sure there's a reason for that. It wasn't deliberate, um, <laughs> but um, you, you're the first person we've had on that's, that's working through through a university. So that's um, 
you know, in, in, in the States. So it's just great to know people are working at all these, all these different levels, whether, you know, grassroots or research or public policy, as you're saying. Um, yeah, I just guess we've, we've got to keep on and, um, and see it, um, see it make the change that we're reaching out for. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful, uh, to you for having me on the show and grateful for, for what, you're doing to kind of expand public awareness and appreciation of, of all of these foods um, and both from their cultural history and deliciousness <laughs> and, uh, and everything else. I think you've really done an awful lot to create a market um, uh, for this, which I think is incredibly beneficial. Uh, and I hope that, that we can find a way to, to collaborate together, um, keep moving these things forward. Yeah, yeah, sure we can. We just just got to keep all these conversations going. Just uh, mentioned the, the URL for our project uh, is forage.berkeley.edu. Yeah. Um, uh, if people want to look at, uh, there's links to the papers there and uh, uh, other uh, publication press uh, and, and so forth. And uh, we're on um, Twitter and Instagram as OS Food or Open Source Food. We're going to put all of the links to that um, on our page on the forager website so so people will be able to tap into all of that and um and hopefully so we'll we'll um we'll speak again like uh, in, in a few months time and, and get an update on on everything that's happening there philip terrific thanks a lot all right thanks for being with us thank you take care thank you for joining us for this week's world world podcast and um i'm aware i went off on a slight tangent with the introduction earlier talking about the broader aims of the World Wild podcast and the World Wild project itself. Um, but I'm actually glad I did that because I do want people to realise that this, this is um, an intentionality uh, that, that I, I feel is becoming actualised through the podcast every week. That we are putting um, conversations out there, but where they're all stacked up in a row on the, um, on the homepage there. You've got the opportunity to tap into a lot of different people that are doing very interesting things with wild food or with food or with landscapes and the various different topics that we're we're touching upon and it is kind of weaving that web of link linkages through this medium of the internet and um and specifically the vehicle of a podcast uh and i think it's it's very very powerful you know, you know to pull people together and uh, we, we had an example the other week, um, wonderful example. Mark Lewis had been on the podcast and then Sonny Savage who had been on the podcast the week before. Of all things, Sonny came to Arizona the week after Mark had been on and that had been planned months in advance. So those two guys got to meet and hang out together and uh, Sonny's generated some, some content online telling that story. Uh, and Mark was just saying, well, what's the chances of that? Exactly. There's a, there's a sort of wonderful connectivity and a things working togetherness um, that's happening there um, through through these linkages. And I just want to, I don't know, just sort of every every broadcast we do is, is kind of like breathing life into into that network. And as with every kind of network, you know, I'm just a node in the network. You, you are also a node in the network if you're listening to this podcast. And um, I just encourage you to Kind of breathe life into that as well and spread the word draw this material to uh, the attention of other people and uh, also feedback to us we'd love to hear your comments and feedback you can contact us through the forager website or you can leave obviously as we keep encouraging you to do reviews on the uh, podcast providers where you are but you know we'd just love to hear from you and uh, love to hear your um, suggestions comments even if they're slightly critical we know that we could be no doubt doing things better and also that you consider becoming a, a patron through the patreon page um we're aware that sometimes you know the production values are not that high level but we're doing this on an absolute shoestring at the moment and with a with a few more patrons that would uh that would obviously change we we could feel justified in spending a bit more time and investing in some equipment but anyway, we just want you to know, whoever's, whoever's, whoever you are listening to this podcast, we, we really just welcome you into these conversations.